Hey everybody, this is WebDM, I'm Jim Davis. Before we get to the show, a bit of channel business first. We're taking next week off and we'll be back the week after. And in case you missed the announcement last week, Pruitt has stepped down from co-hosting this show, but he's still a part of the team and everything else we do. WebDM isn't going anywhere, we'll still have the same weekly videos and podcast. We're also not looking to replace Pruitt as co-host because there is no replacing Pruitt. We'll largely have the same type of shows for y'all to enjoy, but you can expect to see some different formats, some shows with just me, some with guest hosts, and others that are interviews like this one. So on today's show, we're talking to Bruce Cordell, senior designer for Monty Cook Games, about adventuring in the plains. Bruce is a prolific game designer whose career spans more than four editions of D&D and includes some of my favorite supplements written for the game. The Gates of Firestorm Peak, Return to the Tomb of Horrors, where I had my first TPK, <laughs> uh, The Sunless Citadel, Third Edition's Manual of the Plains, Libris Mortis, and one of my favorite books for fifth edition, sorry, fourth edition, Open Grave. We dive into what makes adventuring in the plains so compelling, and how MCG's new book, Plane Breaker, brings fresh ideas for plains adventures to 5th edition. It's kickstarting live now, and there's a link in the comments and description for you to check out. Had a great time talking to Bruce, so enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to the show, and we are here today talking with uh, Bruce Cordell, the originator of the Far Realm. You've worked <laughs> worked on so many editions of D&D, like four editions of D&D, I think, uh, talking about uh, new Kickstarter, Plane Breaker, and Planar Adventures in general. Uh, Bruce, how are you? Hey, I'm actually really good. I, uh, I was actually going to mention something about uh, the Far Realm, and uh, you beat me to the punch. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh, good. I'm, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, why don't you we spend a little minute just getting to know you, uh, let our audience uh, be familiarized with your uh, body of work uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, because what I realized is that you're like the author of all of my favorite second edition adventures, all of like a half of the books that I love from third edition. <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about uh, your background? Well, I've been working full time in the game industry since uh, 1995. So, and when you're when you're working full time as a, your day job, it turns out the books can can really pile up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I started in second edition. My very first project was Gates of Firestorm Peak, in fact, and uh, went on from there to write many different things. Um, third edition came out. I wrote the first adventure for that, which was um, Sunless Citadel. Uh, Stayed through third, worked on fourth edition, and of course I, I worked on fifth edition and was part of the design team for that. And I finally left that, left uh, TSR, uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast <laughs> in uh, 2013 and uh, joined up with uh, MCG, Monty Cook Games, and mm -hmm. I've been working uh, with them, writing books full time uh, since then. So yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a library of stuff that, that I, I put out there for people who are interested in picking up RPG material. Yeah, yeah, and just and really some like conceptually diverse uh, stuff as well. Like you said, the, the Far Realm, like it, it, as, as part of your first uh, like design release, yeah, uh, that you had that, yeah. Yeah, and back, back at TSR, the design times back when I first started were actually longer. Um, mm -hmm. as the, as time has gone on over the decades, the industry has kind of compressed the amount of time that they give the average designer work on things. So anyway, back, back then I had a, a lot of time, probably mm -hmm. double the amount of time. And so kind of could just sit back and, you know, the mappers were, the cartographers were actually in the building. So you could go and talk to them about the maps. Right. And mm -hmm. just kind of. And uh, I don't know, it just really was a really great experience to kind of sit back and write a project that um, I could draw on the resources. I was a new, I was a new designer, so I, I asked a lot of questions. People were always happy to give me, you know, their, their opinions about things. But Very cool. I don't know, I, I kind of, they just said, you know, whatever you want to do with this adventure, make sure you tie it in with player's option, which was an optional rule system back at the time. And uh, 
I did by putting little bullet points at the end of each encounter saying, oh, if you're using player's option, make this tweak at the end. You know, So it wasn't a player's <laughs> option adventure. It was a, a D&D adventure. Right, right. Yeah, that, that was my first introduction to D&D was uh, I made a character without even a player's handbook. It was like, take the player's option, and then we're running uh, you know, one of these oh, new God. adventures from it. So yeah, uh, it's like, what, 12 stats or 18 stats, I think, when it got yeah, broken down. Yeah, jumped right into the deep end. Huh? Yep. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, so I, I cut my teeth on on those and then um, ran Return to the Tomb of Horrors as, uh, as part of a third edition epic level uh, uh, campaign for friends. It was just like, everybody bring your favorite D&D character. Let's put you guys through the Return to the Tomb of Horrors. And uh, I think we TPK'd somewhere on the final, like you're in the negative energy plane somewhere. And it was just, it was brutal. <laughs> it was yeah, brutal. I was going to say, how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it ended in a bloodbath. <laughs> When I was working on that, I turned over three-fourths of the draft uh, to um, Jim Ward, and he was like, yeah, this is nice, but uh, make it deadlier. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> there so, you go. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, we had a great time. Had an absolute great time, and got to test out some uh, on-the-fly third edition epic level conversions, so it, was, uh, it put me through my paces as a DM. But um, yeah, I'm... So that, that's sort of a, the beginning of your career. And here you are, you've been working for MCG uh, for the last few years, putting out a ton of great stuff for the Cypher system and other projects that you guys have over there. And you got a new one, Plane Breaker, yeah? Why don't you tell that's us a bit right. about that? <laughs> yeah, well, we, uh, we decided that we were going to come out with a fifth edition compatible uh, supplement, or series of supplements, actually. Um, and it, the... Uh, the, f the framing is the the plane breaker, but the the which I'll talk about specifically. But um, the book is going to contain lots of really cool new planar locations uh, that are going to be ready to go and allow the GM just to kind of drop them right into their game. But it's also going to contain lots of new player options, subclasses specifically, and feats and spells and items and other things that a, that a player uh, can look at and be like, oh. I, I wanna I wanna do this the shadow stitched rogue right you know I wanna stitch a shadow from an extra planar creature to my shadow Sweet. that that will be fun <laughs> that kind of stuff so that's that's the kind of thing it is the plane breaker itself the conceit is that there's this moon like object that's kind of been hurtling through the planes uh, since the beginning of the multiverse there's kind of a mystery wrapped around that it's it's, it's a fleeing a catastrophe from before the beginning of time. Um, and as it kind of as it uh, breaks through dimension to dimension over all this time, uh, debris from all these dimensions kind of adheres to its surface, on the, creating this the sea of uncertainty mm -hmm. filled with world world pools, and uh, people can kind of uh, you know investigate that. Or there's a city on this plane breaker as well called uh, Timeborn, B O R N E, and. Uh, yeah, there's lots of interesting, you know, th those are new planar locations in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. And they have the frame, the framework framing mechanism for the entire series of books that we're putting out. I love the idea that like, it's the planes come to your campaign, right? Like you don't, it, it sort of like reverses the, you know, instead of you going out there to these other worldly realms, it's like, no, this is coming crashing right towards you. <laughs> That, that's one way that the GM can say, hey, welcome to the planes. The plane breaker's overhead. Do you want to get on? Um, that, if you don't want to be so, so dramatic, uh, we, there, there's something called the capital P path. Um, and every dimension through which the plane breaker has previously crashed, it's kind of left this scar behind. And uh, if the GM wants to, they can give you a, a path token. And path tokens are these sort of weird... They look like coins of exotic mintage, essentially, but they kind of fall. They have fallen. They might be in some creature's hoard or whatever. Anyway, the GM, there's we give you suggestions on how you might get one into a player's hand, and they realize it's something weird, and they can kind of get onto the path, and from there, the multiverse is theirs, just so long as they hold on to their token. That's and really uh, cool. they could they could allow <laughs> themselves to be pulled all the way back to the plane breaker, or they could just use the path to travel the planes for a specific purpose, you know, uh, which is often going to be the case in an adventure, right? GM says, "Here's the problem. You must go to place in other dimension to solve the problem and have wonderful adventures along the way." So, the path yeah. is going to be very useful for that. 
Yeah, certainly. Yeah, because it's like otherwise the the planes are kind of this inaccessible location for a lot of like vanilla D and D, right? Like you're you're over there slumming it in the caves, of chaos, that kind of thing, and and the planes are these lofty, otherworldly places, and like this is so much more immediate and and like gameable, I think, of an idea to just say like, yeah, you found this in a hoard somewhere you know the old wizard gave you this token and said you know when you need it use it um that's really cool i like that idea <laughs> oh good yeah no i we we wanted to make the planes something that was reasonable for a first level character to potentially go you know it's going to be dangerous well first level characters have it tough regardless of of their situation but uh yeah this will this will be fun yeah <laughs> that's great i like that um so I'd like to take a step back for just a minute and, and talk about the planes as like a backdrop for uh, fantasy adventures. Like to me, there's so much about planar adventures or just the concept of them as a, as a place, like where are you getting your imagination fuel from as you're thinking about this? Like, what are you drawing on? What sort of inspirations are you uh, got going on? Well, I was, I mean, I, I've, I've written, I've read, you know, I read, I've read fantasy and science fiction constantly since I was able to read. And, uh, you know, ever since I've been able to write fic fiction, I've written about planar stuff from the very first adventure, as we just talked about, you know, and then on, I, I feel like a lot of the things that I've written have a kind of a planar component to them. And I'm always kind of noodling, right? I'm always trying to explore a, a new way of looking at it, right? Because if you write, ta I, so I, I wrote, Guide to the Ethereal Plane back at the, back at TSR. I wrote mm -hmm. Tangents for Alternity, which was a planar source book. I wrote Into the Outside, which was a planar source book for Numenera. Mm -hmm. And I wrote The Strange, which is a whole game line that is entirely based on fragment realities. And so, and I've also written some other things, which, <laughs> but you have to come up, you know, you can't just be like, well, here's the same thing over and over again. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's boring not only for me, I mean, for customers, it's also boring for me. So influence is kind of like, can you outdo yourself ag again? Can you do something different again? Yes, of course you can if you have the time to think about it, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. it, the multiverse. Uh, the multiverse, the many worlds theory, just to get, you know, if you think about it, not only can everything exist, it's almost mandatory. And yeah. everything that you can imagine exists, but... but there's so many more things you can't imagine, right? The human experience is so limited. All we can really do is iterate on our imaginative ideas and, you know, kind of in this, uh, whatever the, the word is for when you iterate on an idea, mm, <laughs> a di yeah, yeah. dialectic, <laughs> I think, dialectic. And um, sounds right. And move on from there. And then maybe you can, you know, break new ground or, or plane break new ground. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Like t to me, like one of the more fascinating things about fantasy is that we have our own like real world esoteric traditions. There's fringe science, pseudoscience, pseudo history. There's all these sort of like what in academia is like crackpot, you know, no one's given these people the time of day as a source of like inspiration. It's incredibly rich and powerful. I, I find it for me, um, that's usually where I go to when I'm looking for some fresh uh, inspiration sources. And like the idea of higher dimensions, alternate states of reality, um, you know, parallel, like in, in this universe, you made this decision, uh, you know, as opposed to something else or, or, you know, this other event happened another way that the gaming possibilities for that are just limitless, right? <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, any, any book you pick up off your shelf or, you know, any TV show, I mean, the influences are just crazily available to anyone doing writing of any sort, of course. I mean, really, when you think about any fictional writing, it's an alternate alternate dimension. It's uh, it's when you say, you know, how, how do you, you know, how do you define, well, this is a parallel reality. Of course it is. And But then it, when you go into the world of, D, of, you know, 5e and RPGs and all this other stuff, there's kind of this expectation, there's kind of this framework that you, that you package it in. And that, you know, gives it its own, it's a, its own flavor, its own cosmology, I guess. Yeah. 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 And it's, it, it, at some point it is sort of like, um, you know, such well-trod ground that you want to try something different and 
Like for me, I found that reconceptualizing something familiar is like, well, it's, it's like the planes, but it's different. We've done Planescape before. We've played that game. We did it this time. They're alien dimensions that, you know, they just, you just think that they're angels and devils and things like that. They're, they're you know, they're not going to say no to that. Um, so that's, that's one way that I've gone. Um, I'm curious what, what, what's the spark that got you going for plane breaker from that like high concept uh point of view what was it that was like i have to make this thing um well you know it's it's from small pebbles that you know big moon sized objects hurtle through the sky i guess so to say <laughs> uh, so we actually have been thinking you know it'd be cool if we did something you know in all honesty we should do a 5e product that has wide appeal right what would have wide appeal well what do, what do we love well, we, we love Planescape. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, Planescape, when that came out, I was uh, working in a completely different field, and I'd, I had never picked up second edition. I'd stuck with first edition, and then I turned uh, to Iron Crown Enterprise's Rollmaster. Mm -hmm. And um, it was Planescape when I saw that box and just imagined what could possibly be in it that kind of brought me back second edition. And then, of course, I got hired by TSR, and then I was definitely in. But anyway, I think I've gotten off the... Uh, Oh yeah, I've gotten off the thing. So, so from the small idea of like, let's make a fifth edition thing. Let's make something to do with the planes. I just, you know, went to the well, which is in this case sitting in my car because there's a new location, and just you know thought about it, thought about it, and threw out some ideas to our the design team, um, the whole design team, including you know Monty and Sean, Shauna, Terry, and um, it's like, oh, you know. Let's, you know, we let that, you know, something here, let's go back. So I went back, you know, and I thought some more and more. And, and then it was the kind of the second time around, it was the plane breaker that emerged that, as it's kind of currently conceived. And that's kind of what we've gone forward with. I uh, kind of wrote, wrote up this text to sell it to the team. Uh, and uh, Charles, who's our, you know, marketing CEO, all that sort of, he, and putting together, he's the showrunner for this uh, Kickstarter. He, he essentially used a lot of that text that I used to sell to the team as part of the uh, Kickstarter to sell to the general public. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of where it came up, but it was, you know, a process, right? It was an iterative process and new ideas, you know, new ideas to like this week. I've like, Oh, we need to tweak this wording here because we've actually um, changed this in design and conception. I mean, ultimately, of course, what we promise in the Kickstarter is going to be very close but if there's like a word that's wrong here and there, you know, no one, you know, six months down the road, you'd be like, oh, well, you said tide pool and now it's whirlpool. I don't know. Right. That's lied to me. But anyway, right, that's yeah. a long story about how the plane breaker came to be. But it's one of those things where you have to be excited about it. And once you're excited about it, then you look forward to putting your, your seat in the chair and, you know, thinking or writing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, it, and like a fresh take on some old ideas is always, uh, you know, appreciated. I know for me that my attention is up when I'm like, wait a minute, Bruce Cordell, Monty Cook, Sean K. Reynolds, like, like the teams getting back together doing some Planescape stuff. We're doing really some like, like, and not just like rehashing, right? Like there's a, some sense of like nostalgia for, for something like Planescape. But to me, it's like, I have the Planescape I need. It exists. It's available, you know, and, and uh, accessible now more than probably it was when it first came out. And like, I can, I can always go back to a prior edition and read it and be inspired, but like something new and, and like fresh is what I like. And one of the things that I saw is sort of like a, uh, in, in influence or maybe inspiration was that uh, tide pool, right? Of like the idea that the ocean like leaves behind these little mini, you know, mini oceans, I guess. I, I'm yeah. not a biologist or oceanographer or anything, but you know, that like the crabs and fish, whatever are there, and then the tide comes back in and they're, you know, connected with the, uh, you know, the world ocean that were, as it were like that, that concept applied to the plains is like, okay all right just i have to sit with it for a minute because it, the implications are uh, are quite vast <laughs> the uh yeah it's 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 a fun thing because if you and i'm now talking specifically of the site the plane breaker if you um if you if you find yourself on the plane breaker or if you okay let's say you find yourself on the path and mm. you know you're you're trying to find another location and maybe you have a path token maybe you don't so you, know, you could be a little bit lost but if you just kind of let yourself go with this sort of undertow that exists on the path you can feel at all times you'll slowly be drawn along the path faster and faster until you're basically you know in a 
just fall, you know, you're drawn to the plane breaker and fall into the sea of uncertainty. And there, you know, you can find this, this sea, which is essentially planar residue, even planar particles that kind of forms this water like su uh, surface over most of this moon. Yeah. And, and so it's filled with interesting things, lots of flotsam, lots of things, sometimes other creatures, but you know, you can go, uh, salvage you can be a beachcomber on nice. the sea of uncertainty very cool very cool for me one of the things that i uh struggled with whenever i was running a planar adventure is just how to make it distinctly planar and like what is it that that defines planar adventure as opposed to just this is a fantastic magical location in your own backyard and so like i'm curious as to you know where you're coming from like what is it that makes something a planar adventure uh, and 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 like how do you capture that uh, to present to people. Well, right. I mean, it's you know at the very at the very least, it's um, you have to travel. You have to be able to go to an otherwise impossible to reach location, right? I mean, hmm. it's as simple as that. But I would say that the planar adventure is something uh, something something impossible happens because of a of an extra planar influence and you know if it's an adventure you know the pcs have to have the opportunity to locate the source of that influence which could be a gate you know that's that's a, that's the standard answer but it could be a creature you know mm -hmm. maybe something an extra dimensional entity is in your realm and so you have to uh um you know fight it or convince it to go away or to stop whatever weird you know, uh influence it has could be a meme right that's somehow causing real uh, reality to kind of blur and blend and so uh -huh, how to uh -huh. you know stamp out that meme will be an interesting exercise to uh thing but it's it's planar it's extra i mean yeah planar i always say extra planar but you know planar everyone knows what mm -hmm. planar means is, sure, is, yeah. uh, <laughs> at some basically at some point you need to kind of pull back the curtain and mm -hmm. describe something and the players go oh you know, I didn't. I wasn't expecting this vista, or I wasn't expecting that. You know, particular situation happen because we're in Avernus, or you right. know, or, or some other location. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, in in many ways, the, the question I'm I'm you know posing is very sort of like it's like you know, well, obviously it's a planar. You know, but like that idea of like this this is impossible with without the influence of the planes, this thing couldn't be happening, uh, or or this this phenomenon, or you know, I I like the idea of the you know something that would we associate with like a location not being tied to a location like to a creature to a, a meme or something like that of of you know when you think this thought then you're in this other place yes the, the, that that I mean, we've now stepped into the holy fantastic for me and i'm like i'm all right, all right okay we're playing dnd what's happening <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the thought i need to not think or, <laughs> right. yeah listen, yeah how do i tell my, <laughs> right, you know are we talking is this out of character talk in character talk how are we handling this um because i do think that there's like a a a line of like okay well we, we've been to the dragon's lair there was magical stuff there we've you know we visited the enchanted forest that kind of thing but like the plains have uh you know this otherworldly and impossible quality to them that as a dm i found hard to capture but like would never stop being inspired by uh and i, I think that's really kind of what drives that question there of like what is it, what's the essence of a planar uh, adventure yeah. It's hard, it's hard to, to nail down. I agree. It's um, it, it's uh, it's it's the sense of, of otherness that's a step beyond your your average everyday D and D otherness, and that's pretty much what you said, right? You know, it's it's not it's not the dragon in the cave. It's 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 the dragon. It's the portal dragon who breathes, you know, black holes or, or portals or something like that, right? So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, not, maybe not black that's holes. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Unless it's that's the, for the when you're ready to dragon. end your campaign, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, so, like, uh, st speaking specifically of like fifth edition and and Plane Breaker, um, uh, what are you hoping that fans of Five Year are going to get out of Plane Breaker in terms of like their play experience? Because Five has been around for a while now, and for me, I think like finding something new and fresh is uh, is going to be a priority for a lot of tables. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, 5e fans, I'm sure, are always looking for fun new ideas. And at MCG, we're, we're always creating fun new ideas, but it's always, for the most part, it's Cypher System. 
And mm. so for a lot of 5e fans, it's just like, oh, I, I don't even know what that is, right? I'm not looking for that. So, <laughs> so, you know, to the extent, you know, right off the bat, to the extent that we're creating something that's written for 5e rather than, you know, written for the Cypher system and then converted to 5e, um, I think the 5e fans will, will find that, um, you know, oh, th this was written for us and, um, and at least take a look, right? And once they take a look, they will see that hopefully that, you know, we'll, we're going to have several previews and stuff like that. We'll talk about the stuff that they will be intrigued by the concepts that we're, you know, kind of putting before them, you know, the various subclasses and planar species that we're describing. Uh, hopefully with, you know, people, my own and Monty's and Sean's experience writing, we can, you know, present something that they can hope they will hopefully find, you know, satisfying for them. And uh, kind of that's, that's what we want to give. We want to give the GM this, great resource for uh, creating fun new planar adventures and we want to give players if you know if the GM will allow it in their campaign you know twists for their characters interesting subclasses they don't have to go to the planes to get these subclasses right I mean that's mm. that's point one if they're planar inspired <laughs> subclasses feats spells and uh, of course the a best area of new interesting creatures um, that's you know back for the GMs to use but um, you know it's going to be a lot of a lot of great stuff that we're excited to uh, to put out there for people to hopefully enjoy and, and experience in their games. Yeah, I I would say that like cipher game books are some of the most conceptually dense uh, rules books or game books that I, I read. Like they're just every page is just dripping with adventure ideas and and stuff to use both for like world building as well as uh you know adventure hooks and the like um so i'm excited to see how how that uh turns out for uh for planar adventures in, in 5e um you mentioned something about uh, you know tools for gms and uh for me i'm i'm always kind of on the lookout for what sort of gm support is there for like turning the the ideas in a game book into an actual you know game session so what sort of tools and the like are you going to have for GMs, uh, either for building planar adventures or for that like high level world building uh, type uh, DM work? I one of the things that I actually like as a as a GM myself, if I'm if I'm either running something that I prepared or or if it's published material, I actually like to have things, you know broken down for me i like to have the read aloud text right i like to have i like to have the encounter right there you know it's fine to have uh, all these things that give you great advice for having for, for the gm coming up with their own game but plane breaker is going to have both right it's going to have you know sort of like some conceptual stuff about each location but it's going to have here's some read aloud text here's where the players end up here's who they encounter here's the situations that will rise and you know you know probably a little story-based thing that's going you know on within each place that they can encounter so from that sense they'd be like oh pfft, you end up at the uh, citadel of the fate eater you know what do you do right and here's 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 the picture here's the thing right so it's going to be it's going to be really useful in that sense so that's kind of like one of the main tools that that we're going to provide and like i said the tool of traveling the planes using the path the path token um should make it really easy for someone to utilize this material by just opening the book and going if yeah. they're familiar with 5e uh, rules <laughs> sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I really i really like the idea of, of of what sounds like a very like modular approach to it because you know homebrew it uh, you know your own campaigns is, is very important to me that's how i always run uh D D, and so like to be able to say like i need this thing at an instant or like i've got an hour you know till a game or something or to be able to just sit down with a book with as much time uh, as I've got. Um, like, that's a very, I find that those books are, are ones I keep reaching to uh, over and over again. I'm not sure I had a question in that comment, um, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I think um, as we're sort of sitting here talking about GM tools, um, one of the things I'm kind of thinking about is like from your perspective, like as an adventure writer, um how is it that gms can like really draw that out how, like, how can they get the most out of something like plane, plane breaker to like really uh highlight the planar elements uh in the games that they're running you know what, whatever this original situation is of course will probably be mystery potentially maybe not you know but maybe you know let's just say that um 
the plane is starting to erode or crumble because of some curse, right? And the players are trying to figure that out. And basically, they need to understand the situation. And they, they have to understand that they're about to cross a threshold into something completely new. And so I would say don't stint on describing that particular juncture, you know, the elements, like a different skies, a different color, you know, that's, you know, the, the gravity is, is, is different. Maybe objects are floating. The flora, you know, is, is the leaves are, you know, stone or whatever, right? So you can just don't stint on the, uh, on the visual description. And that way that will kind of hammer home. It's like, nope, you, you're not home anymore. You're in a new realm of existence, right? The fabric of reality is different. And you can tell them that straight up too. Describe some elements and then say, your character understands that they've entered into a new realm of existence. And they're like, okay, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm more going, okay, I, I, what if, what if we're about to get into maybe so some, some like game mechanic stuff or something like, and I love that it, that, that it's the description. You're right. You're absolutely right. Like it's, it's portraying sort of what the place is like from the character's perspective is the great way to just sort of get the player's in the mindset of like we're really in a different place here this is a different uh you know the rules are different here and it's worth uh reminding ourselves as gms to like don't skip out on the description love it love it <laughs> i mean you're right i mean if there is a uh, if there is is a rule that's different if magic works differently right but they don't know that right off the bat necessarily unless gravity is is is, is <laughs> weird and you know, every time they take a step down pebbles you know float in the air or whatever that's kind of a classic sort of trope i've seen that i love though i i can never get enough of it so yeah yeah so so, i mean the classics are classics for a reason right because they they do what they got to (laughs) do very good um i bruce is there anything that we we missed any any part of uh plane breaker or something that's going to be in it that uh that we we skipped right past that you'd like to uh to talk about the kickstarter is going to have uh, various um other elements you know, at you know, it's going to have these books. Um, we're going to have STLs, uh, and you know, at the highest level, we're going to have actually physical miniatures. So that's kind of exciting. Um, some of these uh, new species, like the incarnate, spelled with a K, is kind of this winged humanoid species that a player can play. And the wing that they have is actually a glyph, and they embody a concept. Like concept could be uncertainty or belief or something like that and that's going to somehow um give the incarnate you know an ability uh, related to that concept that the, their glyph wing uh demonstrates so you know just we we're just trying to put a lot of interesting like, oh i haven't thought about that before sort of uh, situations going on in there <laughs> yeah yeah I, that's a really cool like the the linking of sort of um this kind of they could fly but they but there's not like wings they're sort of a a physical manifestation of this concept that they have like the pairing of those ideas i'm just like again i'm gonna sit here kind of like all right just a minute <laughs> don't want to uh, get too distracted with it but that's really cool because it's not just another elf you know it's not just sort of another kind of uh, fantasy player option it's something that's like really different and to me is like captures what it is that planar adventures are all about which is that you could meet someone or play someone that's a like the embodiment of a concept and oh that's really cool i love that <laughs> i really love that <laughs> we have a, another species that players can play called it just right now it's called the traveler and basically every so often they're a plain touched human kind of like i guess like a tiefling in a way mm-hmm. um but they they're kind of born with this um these lines tattoo like etched on their skin but it's actually obviously a map and uh they uh have kind of this yearning once they reach a certain age to travel to a far off place and uh it is in the plains right and their yeah. their their map will give them obviously some abilities to actually probably locate the path and, and that kind of stuff and, and it's a fun sort of thing like you said so we're just trying to really come up with uh, new ideas for uh for all these entities um and things and options so yeah, yeah. Any, anyway i could I won't just keep enumerating fun things that'll be in the game. But. No, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I got, I, I get you. But, uh, what I, what I like is the possibility of like integrating them into a whole in, you know, in your campaign world or just the campaign world, as it were. You know, the, the idea that you can really weave something that's very 
rich and textured and, and not just like, oh yeah, it's just the planes. It's just, you know, you maybe you go there, but through these player options, you have a way to like world build and create something that's very unique uh, for your table. Um, it's those kind of things that I think are really, uh, really make a, uh, a game supplement just uh, extra special for uh, for a game group. Um, so yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, was think, I think I just want to say when you know back when you're asking what essence of planar, uh, what the essence of the planar stuff is, it's it's that kind of building off what you were just saying. It's not just the planes, right? It's there's you got to present the mystery, right? There's got to be a little mystery at the heart. It's not just a lore dump, you know. It's a it's something you might not might not end up knowing the answer to. You just you're trying to unravel it. You're seeing the edges of it, and that's and that's a planar adventure to me. You're, you're unraveling the edges of some greater some greater mystery. Yeah, yeah, and it really plays nicely with like the way that D and D and other sort of traditional fantasy, like you have this progression of sort of power curve from first level, and you know as you go up, and like what you what your characters understand about the world itself ought to change as well, and without there being big secrets to uncover, like big questions to get involved in for your casters to mull over, or your you know your warriors to be champions of, then like you're like you're leaving so much off the table in terms of setting yourself up for a long-term campaign or a higher level campaign where you're able to go across the the various planes of existence and have these adventures and like to me it starts at that early level by having these questions and secrets baked in and like just little hints dropped throughout the uh, early levels of a campaign um for uh, you know see how they pay off later <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Bruce, really appreciate it. Um, loved having you on. Love the chat. Um, really looking forward to to, uh, to, to Plane Breaker. Um, we will have those links uh, available for everybody uh, so that uh, anybody out there is curious, will be able to check it out. And um, yeah, Bruce, anything else that you'd uh, like to say or plug or well, something I, we forgot? Well, actually, right, <laughs> right before this uh, interview, I made a bit.ly bit.ly slash plane breaker one word that that leads to you know right now it's the uh, sign up but it'll be the actual you know plane breaker itself so you can go right there right now if you're interested in at least reading the front of the of the uh, screen and seeing seeing what we're offering it's a, very it's a cool. fun read very cool we'll have that for but, you guys yeah thank you very much that's all <laughs> all right uh, we'll see you guys later and talk to you next week bye hey hope you like the show and if you like what we do here, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. To get just the show audio plus bonus content, check out WebDM Talks on your favorite podcasting app. And for over 200 exclusive podcast episodes and way more, join our WebDM Patreon. We put out a bonus podcast every Friday. Finally, we are almost done writing our book. Pre-order Weird Wastelands now. All these links in the description. Check them out. We'll see you in two weeks. If you like what we do here, you can help us appease the algorithm gods by liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel. And if you want more of our content, bonus content as well, you can check out WebDM Talks over wherever you can find podcasts that you listen to, and that's fine. Uh, you can also go to our Patreon, where you can subscribe uh, further and get other things, like a lot of WebDM episodes and the like. Sometimes other people show up, and they're very good. Uh, <laughs> You could pre-order our uh, book that we're sort of writing. It's partly why my brain is mush right now. Uh, there's links for everything down there. Uh, with Zoll helps us keep the lights on. And uh, yeah, check them out. See you next week. <laughs> or the week after. God damn it. <laughs>